there's an almost hidden subject that's causing controversy, not just on both sides of the Houses of Parliament, but consternation amongst thousands of employers across the UK. It's the new immigration law. And I know that one worrying area for many of my viewers and listeners is their own sector, especially hospitality. That's why today I'm so delighted to be introducing you to one of the top UK immigration law firms, Latitude Law. So let's go and meet Shara Pledger. Hi, Shara. Nice to see you. Yes, thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. Tell me about yourself and about Latitude Law. Well, uh, I'm an associate solicitor for Latitude. Um, I've been with the firm just over 10 years. It was my 10 year anniversary in April. Congratulations. Um, and, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And um, I represent the full breadth, really, of immigration clients. So we as a firm do all work from refugee all the way through to business immigration. My personal focus is business immigration. I'm our corporate lead at the firm. So we represent everybody from SMEs all the way up to sort of big multinational corporations, also education providers, healthcare providers, um, on all aspects of immigration law. Yeah, yeah. So how do you see the, in, the new immigration system uh, as we speak for both employers and individuals, clear or muddied? Uh, muddied, definitely. Yes, I think yeah. um, the, the immigration bill obviously only just had its second reading yeah. and there's obviously a lot of concern as to what this bill is going to mean. But I think one of the things that gets quite mixed um, and a little bit lost in the message as people talk about it is that the immigration bill and what will turn into the act really says nothing about the system that's to come. It kind of wipes away everything that we've had before. And so we know that certain things that we're very used to and very comfortable with in this country to do with free movement and how that operates for an employer, that will be gone. But in terms of what replaces it, that's still yet to be seen. And we've had these kind of inklings really from the government with various um, white papers when we were still with Theresa May as Prime Minister and various other policy announcements with Boris Johnson in charge. But in terms of actual tangible content of what those rules will look like, that's few and far between at the moment. Yeah, so it's mostly a framework that's out there without the detail and the devil is always in the detail, isn't it? Yeah. So in that case, what do you think are the main grey areas in the new rules? I think really it's this idea of how we are going to transition away from the idea of free movement um, with employers always having that sort of ability to, to really sort of fluctuate in terms of how they recruit, mainly mm. to sort of react to demand. If we replace that with the system that we have for non-EU workers at the moment, then it just doesn't lend itself well to that system. It's a much sort of larger, more cumbersome system that involves a lot more applications by employers and employees alike. And in terms of that sort of quick reaction to changing marketplaces, that doesn't really fit in well with the system. And in a time like now, where we have the coronavirus outbreak and how employers will need to react to that as things start to bounce back after things reopen, it's quite concerning, really, that we don't know how they will have the ability to do that moving on from 2020. Yeah, and that's causing a huge amount of consternation. I, I know particularly in my main sector of hospitality. So is more clarification on the way soon? And when do you think that clarif clarification will happen? The plan initially was, apparently, <laughs> that, that government would have some sort of draft in terms of what these new rules would look like, a workable draft. Yeah. ready by autumn in order for people to start to look through that and get used to what that might mean whether this will now be impacted by what's happened with coronavirus over this spring and, and obviously throughout the summer as it continues remains to be seen boris johnson obviously remains very committed that we will still put in action this sort of departure from free movement at the yeah. end of the year so there clearly needs to be a system but i, I don't really think it can be underestimated how bigger task that is to just yeah. completely replace the system that we have that we have a points-based system already it's something that I, I get very tired of saying because there's all this sort of focus on you know we need a points-based system we have a points-based system and we've had that system in place for the best part of a decade mm. but it is a very very unwieldy system and it doesn't in any way represent how people are used to recruiting particularly mm. in sectors like hospitality construction agriculture so for those sectors this will be a huge shift and even if they meet that autumn deadline, that's still not much time for people to get their head around what to do and, and how they need to achieve it. Yeah, it's frightening. And, and at the same time, we've got all the problems with coronavirus recession. And so what happens if, against the PM's wishes, 
there is an extension to Brexit. And we'll just continue as we were. <laughs> well, in an, to an extent, yes. So, um, because we left, obviously, on the 31st of January, yeah. I think lots of people who perhaps don't have those pressures in terms of having to work with a, you know, a large workload or a quick turnover of workload, they, they don't really understand that things haven't really changed as of yet. If we have an extension, then it will just give people a bit more time to make those adjustments. Uh, to give the government some credit where it's due, they have been sort of quite forthcoming in trying to encourage people to, for example, apply for a sponsor license for use yeah. after 2021. But again, that application process, that's more complicated at a time that people are perhaps not able to be in their office, not able to sort of get those um, more administrative aspects, I suppose, of applying yeah. for a new system under control. So even with the government encouraging people to apply, it's still very challenging to meet that deadline at the end of the year. So really an extension of more time would just give people a bit more flexibility. Yeah, and, yeah, and a little less worry in some ways. So um, what impact do you think what's been happening with coronavirus will have on any immigration thoughts? Uh, you know, has, for example, government seen the value of overseas workers to the healthcare system. Um, hmm. Boris Boris had two two nurses, one from New Zealand, one from Portugal, didn't he? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think unhappily, there's a, a big difference between what plays well with sort of popular politics and then what actually filters through to the immigration system. Yeah, and. Obviously, there's been you know a lot that's been very positive in favour of the NHS with clap for carers every Thursday and, and those sorts of similar out shows of support. But in terms of how that actually applies to the immigration system, it's still very very complicated. They have made some concessions. So, for example, um, workers in the NHS are being granted a free extension that takes them through to next year. So they perhaps don't need to worry if they need to extend their status before the year end. That also covers their family members. But there's a real limit to mm. how far reaching those measures are. They, for example, they only include healthcare workers. They don't necessarily include other NHS workers who are key workers nonetheless, whether they're providing direct healthcare or not. It doesn't cover social care. Um, as we speak today, there's um, arguments raging as to the application of the immigration health surcharge and whether it's really correct that we're charging people who come to the UK to work for the NHS to then receive that <laughs> NHS care or yeah. not, you know, because you pay the house surcharge charge whether you receive NHS care or not. So yeah. there's, a, there's a limit, there's a definite limit, I think, to how far the, the Home Office and the government will really react to this current mm. crisis in terms of how it shapes our future system. We haven't really seen any indication so far that long term, there will be a difference from the approach we've seen to date. Yeah, and that's worrying for certain sectors, uh, such as healthcare, as you say. You know, um, one of my son-in-laws is a care home manager and he's worried about where they can find his yeah. staff in the future, you know. And, and yet there are thousands of nurses. One of my Indian clients has got thousands of nurses, uh, healthcare workers ready to come to the UK, but they can't get the basic wage. So um, which of those sectors do you see most challenged in the proposed changes and um, importantly you know you dealing with business every day do you think that the uk may lose its hope for competitiveness and productivity as a result of of these challenges that uh, the various sectors will have I, I think there's a real risk of the uk falling behind in many areas yes yeah. um, i mean it really starts with attitude as well the the idea of us ending free movement and to an extent really trying to kind of close our doors to people it sends quite a powerful message that really dissuades people from wanting to come to the UK and coronavirus or not we can see the crisis that we're currently having in agriculture as a sector in terms mm. of, of not having enough people to pick the crops in the fields yeah. Yeah. and that will I mean that obviously has been compounded by what's happened with COVID-19 but that will probably be a common theme moving forward because mm. it's much less attractive for people to come to the UK nowadays knowing that they might not feel very welcomed yes. and probably won't want to stay or if they found the opportunity to stay they, they wouldn't be able to carry that forward because they wouldn't meet new rules so I think those sectors that have relied on that sort of fluctuating workforce that might sort of react to supply and demand they will really struggle. Hospitality is another key example in that, where obviously, yeah. you know, in our, in our busiest season, we would normally welcome a lot of people from the European Union who would work in our hotels and our bars and our restaurants. And those people just will not have that opportunity anymore. 
Yeah. Well, the Home Office makes some positive steps in terms of what they've indicated for the new system. Crucially, they are reducing some of the salary thresholds, for example, which will be very helpful when you get into the healthcare system, for example, for qualified nurses. Those, they don't go far enough to sort of address some of these other concerns in other sectors. And then the skill cap that they're keeping, this idea of what they term low skilled work, that's a real challenge. And that's where social care, I think, is going to struggle the most because despite everything that's happening with coronavirus, there doesn't seem to be any acceptance that actually social care is a hugely skilled area of work where people are either simply not possible to, they can't do that job or they don't, they don't want to perform that job because they know they don't have the skills to do it. And it has the potential to leave a huge hole in the UK. And that, you know, that will just replace this current public health crisis with a social care crisis where we just don't have people to look after the most vulnerable any longer. Mm. I, I think it's interesting, you know, you've got uh, Priti Patel saying, oh, there's a huge amount of people haven't got a job out there. They can train to be in hospitality. I've been in hospitality for 40 years as a, as a subject matter, and you don't get people coming in. And 90% of, over 90% of workers in kitchen workers in London are overseas. You know, yeah. it's frightening. It really is, yeah. So do you think businesses are really, truly aware of the new immigration rules and their impact? I don't, and I, I don't really think that's businesses' fault either. Um, no. I, I know the government has, in recent times, sort of switched the sort of say, well, people knew this was coming, people knew Brexit was coming, people knew the end of free movement was coming, you should make your arrangements. But how can you plan when you don't know what the system is going to be? There's only so much you can ever do if you don't know what scheme you will be working in. I think we it, we desperately need some clarity in terms of exactly what those rules are going to look like and how they are going to operate. I think people need to understand that if they're going to have a sponsor license, that comes at a cost that's both financial, but also in terms of their time, it's quite administratively burdensome to have yeah. a sponsor under this current scheme so if that will change for the better that's brilliant but in which case businesses need to know so they can make plans about what resources they require when they have to move to this sponsored system yeah i've been very concerned about um uh the poor advice that's been in the marketplace for you know i have lots of clients in um uh, polish restaurants things like that um and hotels and uh, businesses around rochdale that we work with who have gone to um, the supposed government advice thing and all they get is just bland, unclear, muddied stuff. Uh, so what should business leaders be wary of? I think there's a lot of rogue agents, by the way, around. I don't, I don't know what you agree on that, but... Um, yeah, to an extent, yes. I mean, unfortunately, immigration law tends to be an area where people are not very familiar or comfortable with it. And it's, it's an area where people are also quite vulnerable because obviously... Yeah. It, it's so crucial to them whether that's on a personal level it's crucial to your ability to stay or on a kind of business level in terms of your ability to be able to employ who you need to employ so i think people do need to be quite wary to make sure that they are getting proper regulated yeah. advice um, and yeah. employers also need to be very wary about what they say to their workers because they can't give regulated advice by law to their workers so they need to ensure that if they, if they have somebody who requires specialist advice they get it from the correct source as well. And mm. um, I think at the moment, what businesses most need to do is to try to work out with the information they have, which is limited, as we've discussed, what is that landscape going to look for them, like look like for them from 2021, and what measures might they need to put in place now in order to try to be proactively prepared for that. Mm. Even if it is just applying for a sponsor license, yeah. even though we don't know how that scheme exactly will operate having the license in place now or in place before the end of the year will absolutely set somebody in better stead than having to get to January 2021. We find that we do end free movement on that cliff edge and now there's just that those doors are closed and then having to try to react and catch up in relation to get all of those measures in place. So I think there is limited work that people can do at the moment to try to get themselves prepared but they need to try and do it as flexibly as they can because obviously we don't know exactly then how they'll have to use those. those yeah. Moves. Let's just stay with the sponsorship license at the moment, please, because I've I heard from um, our other sources where we've been work, working within Parliament and that, that um, if you don't get one in now, a home office is going to be so besieged and it's understaffed that you could 
be too late. So how do you go about getting this sponsorship license and how does Latitude Law help? Um, it, it's a, a process of several stages, which might not come as a surprise if anyone's had to make any sort of application to... Yeah, 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 right. So um, there is an online application form, which is relatively straightforward. It's basic information about the business. And effectively what the UKBI are testing for here is whether it's a genuine enterprise. So things like is the business registered for BAT and PAYE, those kind of steps that you know, we would ordinarily be very used to seeing with a, a genuine business. With that, however, then comes the sort of subjective elements of the application. So once the online form is submitted, fees are paid, very important for the Home Office, fees are paid. Then the business then submits a small portfolio of supporting documents. Some of those are very straightforward things like business bank statements, proof of that registration, again, just proving that genuine enterprise. But part of that is then this, um, this sort of pre-written document that has to answer certain questions for the Home Office to consider, that looks at why are you applying for a license, what do you do, who do you want to sponsor, what will their role be, and it's that sort of subjective element that can be a bit more concerning in terms of trying to effectively justify why you need a license. Now, it will be very interesting for us to see how the government looks at these new applications post their announcement of, if you think you'll need a license, please apply, because up to date, Mm. All of those applications have been in reaction to a, a specific need to sponsor, usually quite a specific individual, certainly in a specialised role. Whereas now we're looking at sort of these more speculative applications, which is a bit of a shift, really, away from where the government has been focused for the past few years. Um, one thing that employers and potential applicants need to be very, very wary about is that it's absolutely imperative that they have good HR processes in place to do things like monitoring staff absence and staff contact details. Because if they move on to a compliance visit, which is where the Home Office actually physically comes to your property and yeah. talks to you about how you sort of process your workforce and how you keep tabs on them, if you like, you can be refused for failing to have these measures in place. Sponsorship is all about passing the buck, if you like. It's right. about the okay. government saying, you're benefiting from having these workers. So monitoring them is not our problem anymore, it's yours. And we need to be confident that you can do that effectively. So if they get the slightest inkling that you might not have robust procedures in how you would monitor and kind of keep records of your staff, they can refuse your license, which is fine because you think, well, that's okay, I can reapply. It's not a huge financial contribution. I can probably afford that again. But at the moment, we have what's called a cooling off period and it lasts for six months. So if you submit an application now and it gets they've refused in June and you then have a cooling off period of six months to reapply for your license, you're suddenly right up against it in terms yeah. of when you make that new application and when that might get processed. So it's extremely important that applicants are aware of all of these different requirements and they are not easy to find. You will need to be looking at there's sponsor guidance, there's various appendices to sponsor guidance, there's other documents about how to use the online system that the, the Home Office uses, and it's really not simple for employers to find these documents or indeed get the head around them. The sponsor guidance is a large document of many, many, many pages and trying to get an overview in terms of what are the most important points, what do I need to hit, what markers are there that I must meet to get mm. this license. I, I feel that's what a firm like Latitude can offer to an applicant, we can really kind of cut down through all of that volume and set out what the issues are and what somebody needs to do in order to be a successful applicant. And right yeah. now that's absolutely crucial. So you're both saving time and um, reducing risk uh, yes. uh, for the employer, yeah. Okay, so what happens if the UK leaves without a deal? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, obviously when, when we left with the withdrawal agreement, it was really sort of lauded that this is fabulous, you know, we don't have this no deal scenario and that's wonderful. But really in effect, what it did was just sort of push that no deal scenario on by a year. We still very much face that idea that we will have the sort of a cliff edge that was referred to. Um, with the idea being that that wouldn't be such a difficult undertaking for people to manage because we would use 2020 as our transitional period, as it's called, to sort of put these measures in place and for employees to get more used to them, for workers to get a, an understanding of what they need to do. Some of that continues. So things like um, EU nationals who are currently in the UK, for example, their requirement to apply for new documents does extend beyond 2020, extends through to June 2021. 
But for those new arrivals, it is a case of the door shutting on, you know, in December of this year. And were this a normal year, that might be slightly more manageable. But this is as far from a normal year as I think we could possibly get right now in terms of everything that's happened with coronavirus and the recession that's now started and will likely continue for some time. Yeah. So it, we've really lost that ability to sort of have the flexibility to adapt and change ready for that to take effect. And so if we now don't get any kind of extension agreement in place that's beneficial to us, it, it is a very concerning time, I think, for a lot of, of sectors and individual employers in terms of how how they will now have the time to sort of turn on the six months and be able to to get that new system workable for them. To yeah, them. And, and they've got so much on their plate as well, haven't they? You know, particularly some of my hotel groups and that, they're just worrying. So one thing that does concern me at the moment about it all, and perhaps you can give see, some sort of comment about it, What's the legal obligations now that an employer has and when the UK when when the UK leaves the EU? And importantly, how should they actively be supporting staff throughout this time? I mean, there has been a lot of intimidation. I I did a, um, a manufacturing uh, chair uh, of an event in Rochdale and some big employers, one had 300 employees, uh, in the area and 200 of which were um, from overseas, particularly Poland, and they were being intimidated by the the people that were left, you know. So how should employers be supporting people through this particular period? Um, it's a really great question because there are some really sort of clear lines that employers need to make sure they do not cross in the current time. The, yeah. the big thing for an employer, obviously, after free movement ends, is how they will check the right to work for their employees, which obviously, historically, has been an issue about having a new employee. But this is now all of a sudden going to bring in this idea that actually you might have existing and long-term existing employees who suddenly need to prove their right to work for you. Mm. It's very, very important that employers understand that as of right now, while we still remain in this transition period, there is no requirement for EU nationals to have any kind of document that differs to what they had before. So all of those employers who check right to work with um, a national ID card or a passport, for example, they do not need to undertake new measures and they can put undue pressure and improper pressure on yeah. their work by asking them, you know, have you applied for your residence card yet? Can I see it? It's absolutely fine to try and offer proactive support. The, um, the government has released various documents and um, to the publications that employers can print out or put it put around the workplace that show people where they can go to get their, their application forms and where they can act as support from and that sort of supportive role is fine but the idea of suddenly saying right we're going to check everybody's right to work and if you haven't applied for your new residence card as an EU national that's a problem that is absolutely inappropriate and unlawful in the current climate and yeah. so employees do need to be really careful about that. I think engaging with the workforce is really important. Going back to the point you've made about that sort of feeling of intimidation that some of the workforce can currently feel, it's really important, and we've seen this with our own clients, that the workforce that are affected by these changes understand that they are still valued and that they, they will continue to have a job in the future as long as you know they've got different requirements to meet potentially, but they're not that the measures themselves should not be intimidating. If mm. they need support, it's available, whether that's support that is offered by the employer, support that's given by the government, or support from the firm like Latitude, if somebody's case is particularly problematic, that support is available for them to get the documents they need, and then things will continue as normal for those people that are currently here. Um, this is another area, though, where employers have got to obviously make a plan as to how they will manage this moving forward, because all of their new workers from next year will obviously have slightly different requirements in terms of their yep. right to work next. And then moving on from June, when those requirements for current EU nationals to have documents, when they come into force, again, there'll be further changes. And it will be interesting to see how the government brings in those changes and how it's communicated for employers to try and make that, again, a workable system where they might have lots of suddenly different sort of classes, if you like, of employers in terms of of how they're checking those different employees' right to work. It, it will be a challenge, I think, for large businesses to manage. 
Yeah. Shara, um, what you've done is you've convinced me that, um, that what businesses need to do is to go to the consultant rather than the GP in this particular case. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much indeed for that. Now, uh, viewers and listeners, what we're going to be doing is recording some extra um, interview with Shara on particular sectors. And one in particular that I'm sort of keen about is obviously hospitality, but we'll be delving into construction and to healthcare.